Breaking news we're following tonight, a warning from the FBI about interference in the November election. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Carlo Cicchetto. And I'm Barbara Lee Edwards. The FBI says Iran is responsible for emails sent to intimidate American voters and cause unrest, but Russia is also being called out. News 8's Marcella Lee has been following the developments for us and joins us now with the latest. Marcella? Barbara Lee and Carlo, tonight the FBI is alerting the public. It has identified two foreign actors, Iran and Russia, that are taking specific actions, the FBI says, to influence and disrupt the U.S. presidential election. The FBI says it is issuing a warning to the American public so they understand there is disinformation out there, particularly on the Internet. Here is a portion of the announcement that came down from the FBI just a short time ago. We have confirmed that some voter registration information has been obtained by Iran and separately by Russia. This data can be used by foreign actors to attempt to communicate false information to registered voters that they hope will cause confusion, sow chaos, and undermine your confidence in American democracy. To that end, we have already seen Iran sending spoofed emails designed to intimidate voters, incite social unrest, and damage President Trump. We are not going to tolerate foreign interference in our elections or any criminal activity that threatens the sanctity of your vote or undermines public confidence in the outcome of the election. When we see indications of foreign interference or federal election crimes, we're going to aggressively investigate and work with our partners to quickly take appropriate action. The FBI says this is not a partisan issue, that all Americans should trust in the election process. And the FBI adds that people should use caution before sharing disinformation that could be false. We're now less than two weeks away until Election Day, and recent CBS News polls show former Vice President Joe Biden leading President Trump. But both campaigns say the outcome is still up for grabs. Deborah Alferon has more from the White House. With less than two weeks remaining in the 2020 race for the White House, a familiar face hit the campaign trail today, former President Barack Obama. Obama is in Philadelphia making his first in-person campaign appearances on behalf of his former vice president. Joe knows that a first, the first job of a president is to keep us safe from all threats, foreign, domestic, or microscopic. The former president officially endorsed Biden back in April, waiting until the other Democratic candidates had all left the field. He and former First Lady Michelle Obama have since done several remote events for the Biden campaign. It is what it is. Joe Biden has taken a break from the campaign trail to prepare for Thursday night's final presidential debate. President Trump, meanwhile, has been holding rallies in battleground states nearly every night. On Wednesday, he was in Gastonia, North Carolina. If Biden wins, the flag burning demonstrators on the street will be running your federal government. Don't worry, it's not going to happen. 13 days to go. 13 days to go. And we cannot spare a minute, sister. The Democrats also have their eyes on North Carolina. Biden's running mate, Senator Kamala Harris, spent Wednesday touring the state, urging people to vote. Deborah Alfaron, CBS News, the White House. Tomorrow night's debate will be held on the campus of Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. It's at 6, and you can see it right here on CBS 8. Uh, the case against a 14 year old boy arrested on suspicion of battery and committing a hate crime is moving forward in juvenile court. Police say the teen attacked Rabbi Yonatan Halivi October 10th near the 3200 block of Governor Drive, hitting him on the head and yelling a racial slur at him. News 8's Kelly Hassadal spoke to the rabbi today and has new reaction regarding the teen who's been charged. Well, the rabbi actually met with the district attorney's office today to talk about this case moving forward. Now, he says he doesn't want the teen to be punished to the point it ruins his future. He says he would rather that the teen get help. But first, he describes the attack. I actually couldn't believe that it was happening. The truth was I, I was I was shocked. That was probably my, my, my reaction was just total shock. Rabbi Yonatan Halevi was walking his elderly father to synagogue October 10th, dressed for the Jewish celebration of Sukkot, when he says a group of teens that had been harassing him and his congregation for weeks suddenly appeared. One of the young men broke away from the group and he, he told us, move, and we, to get off the sidewalk, we got off the sidewalk, and as soon as we stepped back on, 
he had turned his bike around and he lifted his, his um, right fist up in the air and brought it down as hard as he could on top of my head. Halivi fell to the ground. Uh, he called me uh, a racial slur for black people. It screamed something about white power or something to that effect and sped off back to his group of friends laughing. He called 911. He got a photo of the teen and a name from a bystander. Halivi says he believes the same group of teens is responsible for breaking a window in their van. Halivi had moved his congregation to this location in University City for more space due to COVID-19. I will say that uh, a few times over this group has told, if not myself and my security outside, that, uh, that we're the weirdest looking and ex enter a curse word over here that they've ever seen in their life. And there definitely is something here that motivated them that we are different. Uh, whether how, how much he's aware that we were Jewish or that he hates Jews in particular, I don't know, but the, the, the motivation was most definitely because we're different than him. Police arrested a 14-year-old boy over the weekend. However, Rabbi Halevi says he believes rather than punishment, the teen should be rehabilitated. At this age especially, before he becomes something worse in the future, the system has a chance to help him get better. He says they've increased security at the synagogue. He says the attack really scared his six-year-old son. A community rally held over the weekend helped alleviate some of his family's fears. But he says he hopes others understand this message. It doesn't make a difference that people are different than us, that they look different than us, they act different, whatever difference there may be, that we have so much more in common and we must educate the next generation about that before it gets too late and we, we live in a country that we won't recognize anymore. In University City, Kelly Hassadal, News 8. A tense situation for San Diego police officers today right outside downtown headquarters. A woman walked up to the building around 1230 this afternoon armed with a shotgun. When she tried to take off in her car, officers surrounded it and got her to surrender peacefully. The gun was not loaded, but she did have ammunition. An airsoft gun was also found in her car. The woman is being held for a psychiatric evaluation and San Diego police are in the middle of an hours long standoff with a domestic violence suspect who's camped out on a rooftop in City Heights. It's happening on 35th Street just off University Avenue. It started about two this morning with a call from the suspect's mother who said he broke into her home on Wilson Avenue and got into an argument with her. Police say he took off running through yards and eventually climbed onto that roof. We'll update you on this story on later editions of News 8. Here's a look at today's coronavirus numbers from the county. We had 263 new cases reported. That's about 3% of the more than 10,000 tests taken. Our rolling average is now 2.8%. Officials also announced six new deaths today, and outbreaks continue to be an issue. Six more were reported today, and we remain well above the trigger of seven in seven days. cases. That was the difference between staying in the red tier and starting down the path toward the more restrictive purple tier. News 8's Brandon Lewis has more as he takes us beyond the numbers. Yeah, Carlo and Barbara Lee, it was a matter of just two cases that kept us off the road to purple. The county today discussed its plan to get us off this perpetual ledge of falling into that tier. We could not have gotten any closer to the purple tier uh, without tripping into it than we did. Two cases made the difference between the road to purple and remaining in the red. The county says they were federal inmates who were mistakenly added in by the state. That meant our rate was rounded down to red and not up to purple. One tenth of a point of uh, uh, the rate decreased, but we can do more to make sure that the unadjusted case rate is below the dotted line um, and at least seven or less. This week, cases increased the most among children as more schools reopen. The county called on parents to help keep classrooms open. As more kids return to school, it's very important that we follow the guidelines that the schools and the school districts uh, are giving to keep kids prepared. The road out of red doesn't get easier from here. Statewide hospitalizations are expected to increase 46% over the next month. Our hospital census shows we have plenty of capacity, but the question is whether San Diego can intervene enough to limit spread and start working to back us away from the ledge of falling into purple tier. What's happening is people are uh, lowering their guards, going back to how they functioned before COVID-19, uh, gathering, going to gatherings, uh, gathering at people's homes or at uh, uh, public locations. 
and not adhering to the preventive strategies that we talk about every Wednesday. The county hasn't had an unadjusted rate lower than 6.8 since early September. As a reminder, we need to get below a four in order to start reopening more businesses. The state will next evaluate our numbers on Tuesday. Carlo and Barbara Lee. Two cases. Thanks, Brandon. Theme park officials aren't amused by the governor's reopening guidelines. Many large parks say under the new rules they won't be able to open up until spring at the earliest. Today, Legoland's president said he does not understand why they can't open when other businesses and beaches around them are open. Theme parks create a 100% controlled environment with temperature checks for all guests, mask enforcement, uh, increased sanitization protocols, social distancing, measures that far exceed most daily life experiences and any other leisure activity. Officials are asking Newsom to reconsider the rules, which they call unreasonable and catastrophic. A former La Jolla Country Day school teacher who had a sexual relationship with a 17-year-old student has been sentenced to probation. 37-year-old Jonathan Sammartino, who is the son of a U.S. district judge, could have faced up to one year in local custody and sex offender registration after pleading guilty to an unlawful sex charge with a minor. Two other felony sex counts against him were dismissed after his guilty plea. Prosecutors say the plea deal was reached in part because the victim did not want the case to go to trial. Police are looking for a man who stole a senior citizen's wallet in a grocery store. It happened in the Sports Arena area back on September 23rd at the Ralphs, right on Sports Arena Boulevard. Here's surveillance images of the man police say took the wallet. Police say the 73-year-old woman was shopping on the frozen food aisle when the man waited for her to open a freezer door. And that's when they say he walked over to her cart and took her wallet, which had more than $2,500 inside. Anyone with information should call San Diego Police. Still ahead, the past lessons we've learned from polling when it comes to the presidential election. Plus a daring early morning cliff rescue caught on camera on the California coast. 114. That's how many days it's been since we've actually had measurable rainfall. It looks like that's going to end this weekend. I'm Chief Meteorologist Carlene Chavis.